The views and opinions expressed in this program are not necessarily those of Union Broadcasting, Inc., ESPN 1510, or its employees. The host is solely responsible for the on-air content. The views expressed in this program are for informational purposes only and do not constitute investment advice. Investing in ETFs involves risk, including the potential loss of principal. Any past performance figures discussed are not necessarily indicative of future results. Visit ETFstore.com for more information. Now it's time for the ETF Store Show. The investment pros of the ETF Store discuss everything you need to know about exchange-traded funds and the world of investing. Whether you're an investing expert or just starting out, Nate and Connor will help you get up to date on what's happening on Wall Street and show you how exchange-traded funds can help lower your investment costs, reduce your tax bill, and allow you to take advantage of investment opportunities around the world. And now, the host of the ETF Store Show, Nate Geraci. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the ETF Store Show. Nate Geraci, Connor Kelly, and Jason Lake all in studio this morning. Thanks for tuning in. And as always, if you have questions on anything that we discuss on today's show, or if you would like more information about investing in ETFs, you can call an ETF Store Investment Advisor today at 877-365-ETFs. That's 877-365-3837. Or you can visit us online at ETFstore.com. Well, first of all, I want to wish everyone a happy new year. I hope 2015 is off to a great start for you. I know we're certainly excited to be back in the saddle here for what we hope will be another fun and entertaining and hopefully educational year on the ETF Store show. We do already have a tremendous guest lineup for you in the first quarter. And as always, we're going to do our best to bring you the latest on ETFs and the financial markets. Now, as I mentioned, joining me in studio today are my two market-savvy, ETF-knowledgeable co-hosts, Connor Kelly and Jason Lang. Gentlemen, Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year, Nate, to happy you and all of our listeners. Absolutely. Happy New Year, and I'll accept all of those compliments. Well, I think it's going to be another uh, fun year on the show. And for those of you who have been listening to our program the last few years, you know that for our first show of each year, we like to offer our investing New Year's resolutions. And chances are you've already made a New Year's resolution or two. You know, perhaps exercising a little more or maybe starting that dreaded diet after your holiday eating binge. But we also think it's important to have some investment-related New Year's resolutions. The New Year is certainly an opportune time to sort of wipe the slate clean. And regardless of what you've done with your investments in the past, whether you've made some big mistakes or potentially hit a few home runs, it's always good to start the New Year with a fresh perspective and make sure you're on track to meet what, uh, whatever your goals are. And so today... We're going to walk through six specific New Year's resolutions for you. And guys, I think we have some good ones here this morning. Yeah, Nate, it, it, the New Year is always a, a good time, like you said, for everybody to wipe the slate clean, whether it's in your personal or business life. And obviously your, your physical and mental health are the most important factors that your financial well-being and, and health is certainly not far behind in our opinion. And that's what we're going to focus on today. Well, and I thought before we actually get to our investing New Year's resolutions, Connor and Jason, I'm going to put both of you guys on the spot here. Uh, you're going to have to tell us what your own personal New Year's resolutions are. And I'll tell you mine. Uh, this is going to be a little easier said than done for me, given the business we're in. But I'm going to try and separate myself from my iPhone just a little bit more in the evenings. I have a wonderful family at home, uh, and unfortunately, I find myself checking that darn phone way too much. Uh, I'm, I'm fairly certain I've crossed over what would be considered normal uh, or healthy behavior and actually came across an article in the Washington Post a few weeks ago, and, and this was somewhat tongue-in-cheek, but they said there was the potential for an epidemic of text neck, okay, text neck from everyone constantly hunching over and looking down at their phones, always texting, surfing the web, emailing, all of those things, uh, apparently has caused people to permanently have their neck sort of angled down, uh, and I think I'm developing that. Uh, so I'm going to make a concerted effort to put the phone down, especially in the evenings, uh, and perhaps work on improving my uh, posture just a bit. Nate, my wife is a physical therapist, and unfortunately that was not a tongue-in-cheek article. I mean, the, the um, name for it is eye posture, with people <laughs> constantly hunching over their tablet, their iPhone, you name it. I mean, it is a serious problem. That's a great resolution if my wife is listening to our show this morning. She probably wishes that would be mine as well. Um but with, with the new uh, child on the way, uh, my hope is simply to not completely fall off the wagon of what is currently happening and 
and at least try to stay somewhat active and healthy while we get through the first couple months of a newborn at our house. Yeah, you'll certainly have your uh, hands full here in the new year. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, Connor, your family is getting bigger, so your time is going to be stretched even further. And that, that health is an issue. It's funny you say that. You know, if you watch late night TV or Channel 800 on cable, you'll see these endless commercials for ab rollers and power push-ups. And boy, Madison Avenue knows this time of year people are looking to improve, and, and they're 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 ready to sell you something to do that. Um, for my resolution, a little different. One of the privileges we get in working with a, a you know a client base is that we get to know people pretty well and we get to know a wide range of people young people older people all stages in life and and i always as we do year in reviews with folks and wrap things up i always ask a question you know, what 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 could you have done better what could you have done differently what if you had to do it all over again was there anything you would do differently and some of my older longtime clients say if i could do it again i'd spend a little less time on the business and a little more time on the family, on the relationships. And I, I, that makes sense to me, you know, with, with life at a breakneck pace, you know, everyone's running as fast as they can. You know, money is, is very, very important, but those people and relationships are, you know, at the end of the day, that's, that's, that's what you really want to have. And so my resolution is to spend a little more time with friends and family and deepen some of those relationships. Well, Jason, that's certainly a lot uh, deeper than mine, but I think no question a, a worthy resolution. I think always finding that work-life balance uh, is important. So I think what we should do is perhaps track those throughout the course of the year, and we'll see uh, how each of us is doing and keeping those New Year's resolutions. Now, let's go ahead and get to our six investing-related New Year's resolutions, and we're going to jump right in. The first one we have today may sound simple, uh, but it might be the most important resolution we have, and it's this understand the investments that I own. And I'll suggest a, a quick two-minute test that anyone can do at home. Take out your most recent account statement. Look at each investment you own. And if you can't immediately, and I would say within five or 10 seconds, explain to yourself what the investment is, why you own it, how it works, that should raise a red flag. Uh, and I think when it comes to investing, the golden rule is don't invest in anything you don't understand uh, or couldn't explain to a six-year-old. You know, if you can't explain it on the back of a cocktail napkin or an envelope, you know, you're, that, that is, you know, red flag. There are a lot of benefits to knowing what you own. I want to focus mainly today on the benefits because, you know, we, it can get a little preachy in terms of what, don't do this, don't do that. Let's talk about really th some things you can get your arms around. I think that one of the nicest benefits of knowing what you own is that confidence it gives you. And with all the uncertainty, you know, we're always second guessing ourselves about what we own and why we own it. When you really take the time to understand what is in your brokerage account, you know, that confidence is terrific. And you get to make decisions at that point from financial strength and knowledge, not lack of knowledge. Another benefit I would say, and Connor, you've probably seen this too with your clients, anecdotally, I see clients who know what they own actually get a little higher returns. And there are a lot of subtle reasons for that, but they know what they own. They have a plan. You know, we can look at a statement and within a couple of minutes determine, well, there's a plan there. There's someone who knows what they own, and they're probably going to follow through with it because they know what they're doing. Another advantage of knowing what you own, and we've talked a lot about this in, in our uh, over the over last year, is the product evolution. You know, the ETF space has grown dramatically. You know, knocking on two trillion dollars of assets as of year end, and with all the opportunities there are, if you know what you own and you know what the the, the, the space is, you can really take advantage of that. I guess one pitfall I would add is in in not knowing what you own is having something put into your account or sold you or buying something with some unintended consequences. And there are a lot of different securities out there that have restrictions and commissions, non-tradable securities. You know, those are the kind of things that if you knew you might not have purchased. Well, I think it's interesting because in our industry, sometimes people think that if an investment is more complex, that uh, perhaps it's more sophisticated and I get higher returns because it's so complex. And I, I would offer that it should be, or it is actually the opposite of that, that if you focus on, on simple investments, investments you can understand, I think you have the potential to do better. Sort of your point in, in potentially uh, pursuing higher returns. I think I think simpler is better in the investing world. Well, I think it's, a, it's one of the issues I have with our industry, and we talk about this quite a bit internally, is a lot of people in our industry do a very good job making things seem more complicated than they really are. You know, there are a lot of new 
clients to our firm that that begin working from us that with us that say you know my other advisor it talked down to me like made it seem like this was too complicated it was over my head and and he 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 or she wouldn't even bother trying to explain it because and that's why he's your advisor and you're paying him and and that's not accurate you know anybody can understand and should understand to to Jason and the resolution date that we are discussing at least the basics or the foundation of what and why they own certain items in their portfolio and and that educational theme is obviously why we do this show on a weekly basis but it also carries over to our meetings with our clients to to help them understand why we're doing what we're doing in their portfolio to Jason's points because then they feel more confident when volatility shows up or when things are maybe moving against them in the short term you're less likely to overreact if you at least understand why your investments are reacting like they are. Well, you made an important point there about some advisors potentially talking down or or making things more complex. And and we're going to talk about fees a little bit later in the show. But I think one of the reasons why that happens is in the investment world, some advisors feel like they need to justify that fee. And I think similarly, I was mentioning complex investment products. You know, if you look at a lot of those complex products, they charge a higher fee. And, and and I think that's one of the reasons why if, if the average person can't understand it, well, you know, maybe it is some uh, there's some special sauce there and it justifies uh, having a higher fee. Well, I, it it brings it back to the bet that Warren Buffett started several years ago with a couple of um, investors where he'd said, I will take the S&P 500 versus, you know, you pick the top five or 10 hedge fund managers and take their returns cumulative compared to the S&P uh, 500 index over the next 10 years and and we're not at the end of that 10 year period but we're well more than halfway through it and uh you know year to date or since the inception of that bet the S&P is is th- pouncing on it and pounding on the returns of those you know supposed top 10 hedge funds and that goes to the point Nate usually um simpler is better so that first investing new year's resolution is understand the investments that I own Now, the next Investing Year's resolution we have for you is another one that may seem very basic, but this can, I think without question, have a significant impact on your investment returns. And longtime listeners know this is an area we're very passionate about. I just mentioned it briefly, and the resolution is understand what I'm paying for my investments. Jason, I think back, you and I did a show earlier this year where we talked about how in the investment world, this is actually a lot easier said than done, uh, and, and unfortunately, that's somewhat by design, as I was just hitting on. It, it is. You know, our industry does a pretty good job of obfuscating, in some cases, you know, the product, the price, the commission, and some of the moving parts in, you know, in that quest for complexity, you know, bigger, harder to understand is better, and and that's that's not the case. You, you think about the other things in your life, when you and you want to know what you're paying for, you know, go to the store. Would you ever go to a grocery store and no prices were listed? You know, how would you even know what to budget? How could you compare pricing? And I say that, you know, think about how the Internet has changed everything. Would yes. you, Would you? you know, kind of would you go buy a car or any significant piece of electronics or, you know, as small as an iPod without doing a little due diligence on, online, would you? Right, right. And, and, and what's amazing about the Internet, Jason, is, you know, 10 years ago, that wasn't possible to buy a car you had to go to a lot argue for 30 minutes with the dealer if you wanted a second price you had to start over that process with a different dealer that's not the case anymore you hop online and go to ebay and kelly blue book and cars.com and you have more information than possible the same is true with investments you do you know it's interesting you mentioned the, the car industry automotive industry ask any longtime veteran in that industry and they'll tell you there's before internet and after internet <laughs> when it comes to buying and selling cars because everything is so transparent. And it's interesting if, if, if it's transparent in that industry and in many other industries where any sort of price is involved, why isn't it necessarily transparent in our industry? I think it can be, we can do a lot better job in that. So it's important that we do a better job, but also from a client perspective, you absolutely want to know what you own. And you know, on, that, on that point, Nate, you had mentioned earlier, you know, we, we do a – Madison Avenue does a good job in terms of building brands, and they spend millions and millions of dollars trying to associate brands or more ex- with, with more expensive things. More expensive is better, and if I pay more, I get more. And in some cases, that may be certainly true, but in our industry, 
It may be the opposite. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that goes right into what I was talking about earlier where I said, you know, complex investments aren't necessarily better investments. Well, it's the same here when you look at, at the price or the cost of your investments. Higher price does not necessarily equal a better investment. And, and I would actually suggest that if you start with the universe of lower cost investments, start there, that you'll have a, a much better likelihood of success in terms of long-term returns, starting with that list. And if you were to start on the other end of the spectrum and look at the higher price funds. Well, we talked about this documentary that PBS put out last year. I think it was the retirement the spring, gamble. the retirement gamble, which, which talked about uh, retirement plans in particular and 401k plans, but Generally speaking, it was eye-opening for anybody who saw that. Just the, again, the complexity and the uh, curtain that essentially the investment world tries to, to put up between their investors and the actual cost of their underlying instruments. So that's a fantastic documentary that anybody that hasn't seen it should find online on PBS's website. Um, well, and a point they made in that particular piece, you know, think about what a, a fun cost is currently called. It's called expense ratio you know think about that why why not call it fun fee or fun cost it's called expense ratio and i think that's an example of uh, you know making something that should be relatively easy to find and understand the cost of your investments making it a little bit more difficult because that's not you know everyday terminology that somebody would think oh that's that's how much i'm paying on an annual basis for my fund and i, I want to add on a little bit more to this discussion in terms of understanding what you're paying for there's another massive benefit to that, and that is understanding how your advisor or broker is actually receiving their compensation. Because if you are in commission or loaded products, mutual funds, annuities, etc., your advisor is simply a broker. Their job is to sell you products, and usually those products you know, can be proprietary. The list can be limited, where if you have a fee-only advisor who charges a flat management fee for your assets there's a massive difference in that person's responsibility or liability to to you as their client you know there's there's the fiduciary standard which all fee-based advisors have to their clients and we have that with all of our clients and we have independence and we are agnostic with that compensation setup where advisors who are brokers who are commission-based don't have that same high bar of fiduciary standard to their clients. It's important for that full disclosure. When we talk about this rev this resolution, you know what you're paying for, that's everything you're paying for. And, and I think it's important we stand up and say the financial services industry is a for-profit industry. It is not a non-profit industry. And so – as a consumer of the non of the of that industry, you just want to be fully aware of what you're paying for from whether it's your broker, whether it's your advisor, the brokerage firm, the fees involved with the products you own. You know, there's really a total cost picture to be considered when you're looking at things. Connor, I want to add one other factor about knowing what you're paying for because it extends beyond the individual client. It goes into the retirement plan world, and especially 4K world, where you and I are, are pretty active. And there have actually been lawsuits by participants against the plan itself because the options are too expensive mm -hmm. relative to what else is out there. And I find that fascinating that you know, enough employees of XYZ Corporation come together and say, this isn't right. My retirement plan is not doing what it should be doing because it's too expensive and I'm going to take action. That's that's compelling. It is very compelling. And, and you know, what's important is if you're in a 401k, your options are limited. And it is what it is. And, you know, granted, if things are bad enough, there can be lawsuits or at least discussions with the, with the people at your firm to make a change. But What's so important is for your assets that aren't in your 401k plan, you have total control over where and how those assets are invested. The retirement plan at your at your employer, you're stuck with what they have essentially, and it is what it is. Some are great, some are not so good, but with your funds not in your retirement plan, that's why it's so important, Jason, to not you don't have one hand tied behind your back like you do in some 401k plans. You need to do the best job you possibly can in determining who you're working with, how you're going to have these funds uh, managed, and what you are paying for those investments. I think a good way to think about this, whether we're talking about a 401k account that perhaps you have at work, whether 
you're working with an advisor, maybe you have some retirement accounts with them, or whether you're managing your investments on your own, every penny that you're paying in costs is obviously coming out of your own pocket. And that's one less dollar uh, that you have that can grow over time. These costs add up and you, you start compounding these investment costs over 5, 10, 15, 20 years, depending upon your time frame, it becomes a, a big number. And so, you know, we always believe here at the ETF store, you want to understand every single penny that you're paying for your investments. And certainly some of those costs may very well be warranted, but you want to know what those are. So again, that second resolution is understand what I'm paying for my investments. All right, let's get to a, one more investing New Year's resolution here before break. And this may actually be one that you already have on your list. I think this tends to be a fairly common New Year's resolution. But when it comes to investing, this becomes absolutely critical. The resolution is simply save more money. And I would say if you want to guarantee yourself financial security and independence down the road, obviously you have to start by paying yourself first uh, and then making sure that you give yourself raises as well. Because no matter how good your investment returns are, no matter how good the investment products are that you use, how low cost they are, how well you understand them, at the end of the day, that stuff doesn't matter as much if you're not setting aside enough money to begin with. The quickest way to build wealth is to spend less than you bring home and save the difference. Here's what you need to do as an investor. You need to focus on what you can control. And here's what you can control. You can control your costs. You can control how much risk you feel like you can take. You can control how much you're saving. You cannot control what the markets are going to do. You cannot control your returns. And on the point of saving more, it is hard for people. And it, it can be a very difficult process, especially for younger people, to feel like it, it's even worth it to, to, to start saving if it's not a significant amount of money. But you know, at our firm, we're, we're huge believers in setting up automation to your savings plans. You know, one of the best things about a 401k, and you always, everybody always says this, well, it, I don't even miss the money because it, it is gone before I see my paycheck. Well, you can do that with your investments outside of your 401k plan. And we set these up for almost all of our clients. And you can have an automatic deposit into your Roth IRA, into your joint investment account with your spouse, into your 529s for your kids, you name it. And with that automation, you know you are always paying yourself first. And that is the most important factor for successful long-term saving of your money. Yeah, I would add one thing to that, Connor, in, in not just saving more money, but start saving it earlier. You know, I think it was Einstein that said compound interest is the fourth wonder of the world or something along those lines. And he's right. The we can we can replace a lot of things in our lives. We can replace items, we can replace a house. Anything we can probably get a duplicate of. The one thing we can never have back is time. You know, we're only on this earth for a certain number of years and everyone that clicks by is gone. It's out it's 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 out of the bank. So if we can start saving money earlier in in and have that compound growth help us, it, it helps immeasurably. In in fact, uh, in my discussions with my clients, some of my best clients that I work with that have been very, very successful in accumulating wealth had parents that helped them establish habits of saving money when they were children. Mm -hmm. and, and I would, you know, if there's resolution 3A here before the break, and that is if you have young kids or, or even older kids, one of the best gifts you can give them is the gift of saving and the gift of discipline. Because, boy, you start when you're 10 or 5 or 15 instead of 25 or 35 thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars, financial freedom, and you can give that gift, and it costs very, very little. That's a great point, Jason. It's something that I talk about quite a bit with, with my clients of kids, and you know, you start talking about the basics of money, and, and normally an allowance is the first step of that, right? The value of work and the value of dollars, and they can spend it how they choose, and, and what I recommend is for savings as part of that allowance, you know, 10% of your allowance is going to go towards a checking account or a savings account. So you can buy that, you know, that special gift that you want or that big thing that you're trying to save for down the road. I mean, those are the basics, the fundamentals of investing that unfortunately a lot of our um, younger kids in this country simply aren't learning until it's, it's not, you don't want to say too late. That's, that's a little um, over the top, but until it, they're learning it later than they should. 
But I would say even for people who are, are maybe further along the path of life, whether that's in their 30s, 40s, 50s, I always think a, a, a good way to frame this is you have to sort of fast forward to the future and think about your life at 65 or 70 or 75 and what type of, of quality of life you want to have. And, you know, certainly I, I don't think money can buy happiness, but it, it certainly can help uh, provide a good standard of living when you're in retirement. And, you know, whatever your goals may be, whether that's to, uh, you know, travel the world or visit grandkids or you know, be out on the golf course, whatever those are, I think it's good to think about those goals uh, no matter where you're at sort of along this path because I think that can help in terms of, of the motivation of saving and and certainly for for everybody you know it's tough everybody has obligations whether you know it's paying for a mortgage and a car and and kids and and all the activities it's it's expensive uh, you go to the grocery store you know costs are going up it's expensive but but you have to set aside money for yourself uh, first and, and you have to think in terms of, of longer term goals and, and Jason I actually uh, went and pulled that Albert Einstein uh, quote because I knew we'd be talking about saving and what he said was. Compounding interest is the greatest mathematical discovery of all time. There you go. Okay. okay. He said, compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. He who understands it earns it. He who doesn't pays it. And I think that's framed perfectly. Uh, so, again, that third New Year's resolution, save more money. Let's take a break. And when we come back, we'll give you our other three investing New Year's resolutions. And each of these next three uh, relates to how you might react to the financial markets. These get into the emotional or behavioral side of investing. We'll explain right after the break. This is the ETF Store Show on ESPN 1510. Hi, this is David Van Oy of the Van Oy Group at Reese and Nichols Realtors. Thanks for listening to my friends at the ETF Store. When making decisions about buying or selling a home, you need first someone who is knowledgeable and someone you can trust. With nine years of experience and over $40 million in residential sales, I would love an opportunity to apply for that job. If you would like more information on a specific home or a property evaluation in Missouri, call 536-SOLD. In Kansas, call 259-HOME. Or go to our website, thevanoygroup.com. Tired of running around town trying to find the best products for your business? Regal Distributing can help. With over 9,000 stock products and categories like food service packaging, professional facilities, office supplies, and sustainable janitorial solutions, you'll be sure to find what you need at Regal. Visit us on the web at GetRegal.com or call locally at 913-894-8787. And don't forget to check out Regal's state-of-the-art showroom and training center located off 435 and K-10 Highway. Go with the local partner you can trust. Go with Regal, distributing service and solutions since 1955. There is a revolution occurring in the investment world. Exchange-traded funds, which have been called the next generation mutual funds, can help lower your investment costs, reduce your tax bill, and increase your investment options. This is Nate Geraci with the ETF Store, an investment advisor located right here in Kansas City. Call us toll-free at 877-365-3837 or visit us online at etfstore.com. And don't forget to tune in to the ETF Store Show every Tuesday at 9 a.m. right here on ESPN 1510. Typical estate planning is transactional, focused solely on money, offering cookie-cutter documents, resulting in plans that do not address what is truly important to you and your loved ones. Bridge Builder's unique planning process focuses on the three dimensions of family wealth. Financial, what you own. Human, who you are. And intellectual, what you know. Bridge Builder, plans for life. Architects at protecting and perpetuating family wealth for generations. Please contact Bridge Builder for a free consultation at 913-956-3984. You stains in your carpet keep coming back and now you're stressing over the high cost to replace it? Then you need to call Zero Res. Their carpet cleaning process does not use soaps or toxic chemicals, which all leave behind residues that attract more dirt immediately. This zero residue technology will not only have your carpets looking great, it also extends the life of your carpet. Check them out online at zeroreskc.com or call 816-425-3655 and schedule your cleaning today. Do you want more exposure locally and nationally for you or your company? Do you want to build your brand and reach more potential customers? Then you need J Girl Media. J Girl Media is a full-scale consulting firm that can help you with all your media relations, PR, and public affairs efforts. J Girl Media can also help your business with any marketing, mobile app development, digital media, SEO, or content marketing needs. Grow your brand in an affordable way. Check out jgrowmedia.com today. It's a fact that most any day can be a special day for someone. A birthday, an engagement, an anniversary, a promotion, or 
and I Love You Day. It's also a fact that Lichtenberg's fine jewelry offers hundreds of ways to say love or thanks or congrats or I'm so happy you're in my life. So when you want to make your special day extra special, think Lichtenberg's Fine Jewelry, 131st and State Line, 816-941-2221. Welcome back to the ETS Store Show. Nate Connor and Jason all in studio this morning. We're offering our 2015 Investing New Year's resolutions today. And the first three we gave you are likely the easier ones to keep. Making sure you understand the investments you own, understanding what you're paying for those investments, and saving more. I think those are three pretty tangible, uh, fairly easy to get your head around resolutions. Now, these next three resolutions we have, I think, are the more difficult ones to keep. If you look at the data More often than not, these are the areas that tend to be the cause of underperformance in your portfolio. And interestingly, these are all behavioral behavioral related. Uh, You know, that may come as a surprise to some people. As it turns out, behavior is every bit as important as finding the right investments and lowering investment costs and even saving money. How you behave as an investor can trump all of those things in the end. It can. And I would go a step further. I would tell you that the behavioral aspect to investing is if not the most important, the top one or two. A misconception is that all you need to do is pick the hot stock, hit the home run. You can screw everything else up, but if I hit that home run, get that next you know, fast-growing company, that fixes all ills. And it doesn't. It just simply doesn't. One of the most important aspects that, Connor, you and I bring to the table when we're working with people, and any advisor, good advisor will do, is he helps you make good decisions not based on you know, extraneous factors, but on what's important, help you keep your behavior where it should be. And it's a whole lot harder said than done, um, but it's just a big part of our job description. You know, I'll, 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 you know, this might fall under confessions of an investment advisor, but, you know, one of the neat things we get to do, again, working with many people over the years is that we see a wide variety. And I'll be darned if there isn't a very small subset of the folks I get to work with that continually seem to make tough decisions. And all my clients face tough markets and good markets and rising interest rates and falling interest rates. But a small subset have a very difficult time staying on track. And so it's it, it, it points out that your success is not going to be based on the hot e- ETF or the hot mutual fund or hot investment. It's going to be based on your reaction and your behavior to the things you see as you move through life. Well, let's get to that next investing New Year's resolution. Again, these are all behavior related. So this is number four on our list, and it's be prepared for volatility. And I think you only have to look back to this past September and October for a perfect example of why you want to be prepared. We saw the stock market take a quick nosedive. That caught some investors off guard. Others were surprised at how their portfolio responded. Perhaps they had more risk than what they originally thought. The issue here is if you don't have a plan in place, and you're not prepared for volatility, that can cause you to make less than optimal decisions when volatility does strike, uh, like selling at the bottom of a steep decline. It sure seems like investors have short-term memory. And the volatility that we experienced at the end of of last year, I think caught a lot of people off guard. I mean, the recovery we've had from 2008, especially in U.S. equities, the volatility simply hasn't been there. And it, volatility is part of a normally functioning market, and I think a lot of investors became complacent. And at the end of last year, the volatility surprised so many investors because they hadn't experienced it in a while. And you know, to to the point that we began the segment with, behavior is so important, especially when volatility enters into the marketplace. You know, you have to have a plan in place. And stick to it. And you cannot allow short-term noise to affect your long-term goals as an investor. And that's obviously easier said than done, to be sure. But it's it's vital for all investors to be prepared and accept volatility so they don't overreact to it and do something that they end up regretting. 
It's a, it's a great point. The you know, we live in a what have you done for me lately world, and you know we live by quarterly earnings, and Wall Street seems to jerk forward and back on a three month basis. When volatility through a business cycle can be quarters and years, and so we want to react appropriately. But to your point, since two thousand eight, the Great Recession, you know, there's been a lot of monetary policy, a lot of strange things have happened. It's been an extraordinary time in the market, and volatility has been abnormally low. And so I, I think this is a great recognition that volatility is actually normal, should be expected, and in many cases, welcomed by the equity investor because that presents opportunities. So we, I would say that, that, that many in the industry and in the public have become a little complacent the last few years. Well, Jason, I think that last point you made about opportunity is, is a fantastic point because volatility in and of itself is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, it can be an opportunity. You might be able to purchase some good investments at a discount. It can be a good time to rebalance your portfolio. Uh, it doesn't have to be a negative. So again, that resolution is be prepared for volatility. Again, we're offering our investing New Year's resolutions to kick off 2015 here on the ETF Store Show. And the next one we have is certainly related to what we were just talking about. And the resolution is make decisions based on facts and not emotions. And this is hard to do in investing, especially if you watch the CNBCs of the world, uh, if you read the money section in your local newspaper, maybe you read Money Magazine or Fortune. There are so many talking heads out there. Uh, and I guess you could say we're talking heads, but I like to think that we try to educate and inform versus uh, drive ratings and ad dollars. But the issue here is you may think you're doing yourself a favor by turning on CNBC and, and reading these different publications. But what ends up happening is, all that noise can start to cloud your judgment. You might start reacting to this noise. And I'll be the first to say it's extremely difficult to tune out this noise. If every financial media outlet is talking about how the end is near for stocks and we're on the verge of another financial collapse, uh, which is what we heard back in October, that can be very difficult to ignore. But you have to try and temper your emotions. You have to. You know, it's it's the human condition, Nate. We, we all bring to the decision-making or process, our foibles, our background, our biases, how we were raised. You know, money, is there anything more emotional than money? You know, your family, your health, relationships, you know, money is in the top five for sure. And what, it, what the, the process that can happen is that if you're making decisions not based on facts, but emotions or other things, you can become a little overconfident or you're making decisions based on the wrong information and the outcome may be less than you're looking for. And I'll give you the best example. Whatever it is you do for a living, you've been at a, a Christmas party or an event and you're talking about what you do for a living and someone says, oh, I've done some of that. And, you know, go on to tell you exactly everything that he knows about what you do. And you leave that conversation thinking, that's a great guy. And he knows a fraction of what he really thinks he does. And we're all that way. We all bring that. And, you know, I, you know, I, I've used to fix things up. I think I know more than I do. And so when it comes to money, if we make decisions with that sort of vein, you know, it's, it's a little tongue in cheek, but having all the information and avoiding the emotional aspect is very, very hard to do. It's why in many cases, managing your own money or family's money is much more difficult than managing a professional account or having a professional relationship because that emotion, you can professionally detach from some of the baggage that we all have. Well, one thing I would add to that as well is that Emotion tends to really uh, crop up when the market's doing really, really well or really, really poorly. And quite frankly, those are the worst times to make emotional decisions. Those are the times when you want to be uh, fact-based and disciplined and have a plan in place. Those are the worst times to react emotionally. It, it is the hardest time to do it. And that's what's so counterintuitive. It's at the peaks and valleys where the discipline, the logic, and the facts Boy, if you're not relying on them, you are twisting in the wind with the headlines and your fears and your account balances, and that is a very difficult time to make a decision. Well, I think the goal is to, to take Warren Buffett's advice to heart to a certain extent and, and be a little bit contrarian. You know, his, his famous quote is, I get greedy when other people are fearful, and I get fearful when everybody else is greedy. And I think that's a great point about the emotions and and the, the mob mentality when markets are at, you know, peaks or valleys, but when they're at their extremes is, is you know, you need to take a step back and, and you know, have a, have a longer-term approach and, and try to take those emotions out of it, which is obviously easier said than done. And when you 
as best you can. We'll never remove all the emotion. We're human beings. That's what makes us special. But to the extent you can remove most of the emotion and work on facts, you realize what you can control and what you can't control. It's actually liberating to set aside some of the baggage and preconceived notions and feelings and just look at the facts. And there's a little bit of satisfaction you can take in that. And that sounds odd, but it really, from a decision-making process, it's actually very helpful. Well, that dovetails perfectly into our last Investing New Year's resolution. And this is sort of all-encompassing. This really applies to a lot of what we talked about here today. Our last resolution is recognize what I can control and recognize what I can't control. And if you think about it, when it comes to investing, you can control things like investment costs. How much you save, having a plan in place, making sure you understand your investments. These are all things you can control. But obviously, you can't control the financial markets. You have no control over what stocks and bonds might do. You can't predict what Vladimir Putin might do or whether oil may drop 50%. You just can't predict these things. And I would say if there's one investing New Year's resolution that you post on your refrigerator, for me, it's this one. Control the things that you can control. Know what you can't control. Nate, I'm the last person that should probably be, you know, trying to provide life advice. And this is not a, a self-help show. It's a finance show. But I think knowing the difference between what you can and cannot control and only focusing your time and energy on what you can control is a good way to, to at least try to approach any setting, generally speaking, in, in your life. But, you know, more drilled down to, to investments and what we're discussing here, it's it's hard to do. And... You know, you, whether, to your point, it's the continued atrocities in Syria or the plunging prices in oil, we can't control any of that. You know, you need to focus on what you can. And, and we went through a lot of those um, issues in the first uh, section of the show where it's understand what you own, understand your costs, understand how your portfolio is expected to react or will react in a volatile market. Focus your time and energy on things you can actually impact and control. This great point, Connor. You know, it's that first segment we mentioned. You know, can you save more, save sooner, understand what you're paying for? Those are things that are in your control. You can take action and accomplish them. We haven't suggested go find the hot stock, go buy a lottery ticket, um, get a crystal ball get all the the, the uh, pundits newsletters and try to formulate uh, you know some sort of prognostication mm -hmm. what we focused on are things that if you take demonstrable action you can absolutely make 2015 a better year than 2014 i think a perfect summation of what we covered today jason very well said uh, so there you have it our 2015 investing new year's resolutions again understand what you own in your portfolio understand what you're paying for your investments commit to saving more be prepared for volatility in the markets. Make investment decisions based on facts and not emotions. And lastly, when it comes to investing, control the things you can and recognize what you can't control. I think that's a pretty good list. And if you can keep those resolutions longer than, uh, than Jason or Connor, you guys will be keeping yours. I think you'll be off to a fantastic start for 2015. Let's take a break. And when we come back, we're going to spotlight an ETF that surprised just about everyone with its performance in 2014. And perhaps surprisingly, it's a Vanguard ETF and it doesn't hold stocks. We'll tell you what that is after the break. This is the ETF Store Show on ESPN 1510. For those of you who haven't heard, the oldest building in Kansas City has the newest rooftop deck. Kelly's Westport Inn's rooftop deck has a full-service bar, TVs, bathrooms, lots of fans, and an awesome view of Westport. Kelly's has their weekday happy hour Monday through Friday from 3 to 7. They also have live music every Friday and Saturday night. Come enjoy tunes from bands like Lost Wax, Flanagan's Right Hook, and Michael Beer's Band. Every city has a place where the elite gather for witty conversation over trendy cocktails. In Kansas City, that place is definitely not Kelly's. For more information, go to kellyswestportin.com. Looking to ship freight but not sure how? Choose AOK -OK Freight to be your single source for all your shipping needs, and we'll take care of all the work for you. We offer the balance of budget-friendly prices, seasoned account managers, and trusted trucking options with leading technology. With more than 20 years of experience in the freight shipping industry and having moved over $1 billion in freight, we know the importance of providing competitive rates and dependable services for truckload, LTL, and intermodal freight services for all industries. If you are a company looking to save on your shipping expense without 
giving up dependability, let us be your personal shipping assistant. Call us now at 816-301-6226 or find us on the web at www.aokfreight.com. Are life stresses beginning to take their toll? Take time to maintain your health by seeing one of our exceptional therapists at My Massage Bliss. At My Massage Bliss, we provide a level of service well above the industry standard by providing the best therapist, staff, and value for your time and money. Don't take our word for it. Our ratings and reviews speak for themselves. Come visit us in Overland Park on the corner of 143rd and Metcalf, online at MyMassageBliss.net, or give us a call at 913-956-5100. We look forward to serving you. Will you profit from rising food prices? Bulk Food International. Do you want a tangible asset besides gold or silver? Bulk Food International. Would you like to own an investment that will be valuable 10, 20, 30 years from now? Bulk Food International. With Bulk Food International, you can own a variety of food products that will be viable and valuable for years to come. Bulk Food International will store your products for you or deliver to your location. Best of all, you can use your IRA or 401k funds to make your purchase. Bulk Food International, 816-888-8290. Investing in your future. Want a more beautiful, livable home? Talk to Schlegel Design Remodel. No one offers more ways to add value to your home while saving you money. I'm Jake Schlegel. We have services for every need, like our popular one-week bath and express custom kitchen remodels. Completed in a lot less time for a lot less money. We also offer professional handyman services for chores around your home. Whatever your needs, call Schlegel Design Remodel, 816-361-9669 or go to remodelagain.com today. There's never a bad time to see your dentist. So if you haven't been for a while or if one of your teeth is actually starting to hurt, it's always easier to fix it before it gets worse. We aren't anti-dentites like the Seinfeld episode. So give Dr. Kevin or Matt Cummings a call at 816-246-1003 or check us out on our website, www.cummingsdentistry.com. Remember, floss the ones you want to keep and mention this ad and get a 10% discount on your first visit. When refinancing a mortgage, all of the numbers can become confusing. With First Mortgage Solutions, you only need to remember two, 500, and zero. $500 is the amount our average customer saves every month after refinancing. And zero is the number of loans we've ever done that have ended up in default. At First Mortgage Solutions, business is based on dollars and cents. Saving you dollars with loans that make sense. For more information, call 816-778-7000 or apply online at firstmortgagekc.com. NMLS number 244476. Has it been a while since you or your financial advisor reviewed the investments in your portfolio? With today's ever-changing global economy, it's become more critical than ever to make sure your portfolio is on track. Whether you're managing your own investments or using an advisor, it never hurts to get a second opinion. At the ETF store, we provide free consultations on your portfolio. We'll highlight the strengths and weaknesses and tell you exactly what you're paying for your investments. This is absolutely free. There's no obligation. Just give us a call at 816-363-3837 or click on the free consultation button at etfstore.com. Welcome back to the ETF Store Show on ESPN 1510. Don't forget that each month on the show, we select one question sent in by a listener and we answer it live on the air. We'll actually be doing this next week. And you can send us questions on anything investing or ETF related. Just go to ETFstore.com and click on the Ask the Host button. Or you can send us questions through Twitter. If we select your question, not only will it be featured on the show, you'll also receive a $50 gift card of your choice of either Bella Napoli, the wonderful Italian restaurant in Brookside, or Starbucks. So be sure to send us in your questions. Now it's time for our ETF Spotlight. It's time for the ETF Spotlight, where each week the ETF store highlights one exchange-traded fund. There are over 1,600 ETFs available to invest in. The ETF store sorts through them all so you don't have to. The ETF we're spotlighting this week is the Vanguard Extended Duration Treasury ETF. The ticker on that is EDV. This ETF holds long duration Zero coupon U.S. Treasuries. Now, you might be asking what those are. Zero coupon Treasuries, uh, these are also called strips. These are bonds that are sold at a significant discount by the U.S. government. They don't pay any interest, but at maturity, you get par value back. So simply put, you profit from the difference between what you buy the bond for and then what you get back at maturity. 
the Vanguard Extended Duration Treasury ETF holds a portfolio of these zero-coupon treasuries. Currently, it holds nearly 70 different issues, and they have an average duration of 25 years. As a whole, this ETF is currently yielding 2.75%. And there's a yield here, even though this ETF holds zero-coupon bonds, because the ETF rebalances quarterly. And so as bonds are sold, the proceeds are distributed to shareholders. In 2014, EDV returned some 45%. And its expense ratio is a minuscule 0.12%. So it certainly fits right in with the Vanguard low-cost model. And it's interesting because even though the CTF has nearly half a billion dollars in assets, I think it's, it has sort of flown under the radar. You don't hear much about the CTF. It's it's really in a you know a sleepy little corner of the bond market. You know, a couple of things stand out with a 25-year duration. That's about as long as you can get. Uh, you know, I think there are some gimmicky 50 and 100 year bonds out there. I think the Bank of England has issued some, but you know, for the most part, this is about for the individual investor as long as you would ever consider going out on the curve. So, so that's what stands out to me. Um, you know, Connor, I think you're going to talk about some some duration and, and defining some of the characteristics. But there's two things you look at primarily when you're looking at a bond. One is credit risk, and the other is interest rate risk. You know, these are all issued by the United States government. Government, so there's not a whole lot of credit risk there. You know, if the United States government can't pay its bills, we have a whole lot of problems. So I imagine that's going to happen. But the interest rate risk. So you know, for the for a lot of reasons, or actually one main reason that this that this fund performed so well was because of a very long duration in a declining interest rate environment. You get skyrocketing returns. So you know, you had an environment over the last year that was tailor made for this fund. But it works in the other way, too, in a rising interest rate environment. Yeah, everybody that um, understands the basics of bonds is is this. The bond prices move inversely to rates. So a long-duration fund like this with, like you said, Jason, re- lowering rates uh, last year performed outstandingly well. But you have to understand the risk here. With the duration of 25, what that means to you as an investor is If interest rates go up one full percentage point or 100 basis points, this fund could lose around 25% of its value. Your interest rates don't have to go up 10%. One percent in rates could result in a 25% loss of this fund. That's what a duration of 25 means. So while this is a bond fund, it is not a fund for the weak of heart, for the faint of heart, because the... The risk and the volatility um, in this fund is certainly more equity-like than bond-like. It's it's the last year or two for this fund have been just a perfect storm of conditions where where you know if you own this fund you're either really smart or really lucky because it's about one of the highest performers out there. You know I, I think if we were to bottom line it, you know where does this fit into your portfolio today? And I, and uh, you know every situation is different, but I would probably say that. In today's, where we're at in the interest rate environment and where we may potentially be going, where we're at in the business cycle, you know, a, a satellite holding at best, I would say. At very best. Yeah, this, this would not be a core holding because of the ext- extreme potential for gain and loss. Yeah, now, you're, you're right there, Jason, because this is really, when you're talking about a duration of this, it, it's an interest rate bet. That's what it is. Yeah. It, yeah. Is, not a, it is not a part of a well-diversified bond portfolio for most individual investors now you're some institution or insurance company you know the math is different right your holding period is different but for a retail average investor this is simply um even though it's vanguard and it's a bond fund you know you don't equate those with maybe risk or taking a a market bet but that is what this fund is it is a bet on on a lowering interest rate environment. Now, all that being said, you know, I don't want to sit here and be an interest rate prognosticator, you know, like we've looked at on past shows. You know, I think that this is actually a good example of some of the themes we talked about here today with the New Year's resolutions, you know, one of which just means you can't predict the markets. Uh, And certainly past performance is no guarantee of future returns. I want to be very clear about that with an ETF like EDV. But you would have been hard pressed to find anyone in the markets who thought EDV would return north of 40% in 2014. Boy, when you when we kind of travel back 12 months from now to the start of uh, last year in 2014 to find talking heads that were predicting lower interest rates, you couldn't do it. 
So again, that ETF is the Vanguard Extended Duration ETF. The ticker is EDV. And we'll have to leave it there. That is all the time we have for today's show. Podcasts of the ETF Store show are available at ETFstore.com, Apple iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and also TuneIn Radio. And with any of these, you can very easily listen to the show from any mobile device or tablet. Also, be sure to check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. You can stay up to date on all the latest from both the ETF Store and the ETF Store show. Thanks again for joining us this morning, and be sure to tune in next Tuesday at 9 a.m. We'll be joined by Michael Strain, resident scholar and deputy director of economic policy studies at the American Enterprise Institute. He'll give us his take on the current state of the U.S. economy and tell us what he's watching for in 2015. Until then... Have a great week, everyone.